Welcome to episode four of Islands in the League, presented by DraftKings, our exclusive YouTube video series. We've got a lot of fun stuff for you in this episode. I've got some very general thoughts on what the MVP award should be. And as always, we'll be joined by our resident betting expert, Josh Applebaum from Decent. Episode four, let's go. I was thinking no one ever talks about the MVP race I'm kidding everybody talks about it and it's nauseating and yes at times it has become somewhat toxic I want to address one thing about the MVP award and what the MVP award is I've seen a lot of comments on social media I've seen comments on debate shows that the MVP award should somehow be tied into postseason success. Look, for the entirety of this award and the NBA's history, the MVP has been the most valuable player in the regular season. And call me crazy, but I think it should continue to be. There's a reason we also have the finals MVP. Here's my take. It's a regular season award. It should be based on on the regular season. It should not be based on any past postseason success or failure. It should not be based on any prediction around future postseason success or failure. That's not what the award is. The award asks a simple question. Who was the most valuable player for this particular 82-game season? Now, the nature of the award and the nature of voting on the award has always been a very subjective thing. What does the voter value? Does the voter value impact on winning? Does the voter value the eye test? In modern times, does the voter value analytics? Does the voter simply value individual dominance? Whatever it is, your opinion about this award is subjective. Because in any given year, there are a number of players that are deserving of the award. And this year is no different. I've seen the complaint quite frequently over the last month or so that if a player has not won an NBA championship or because you think a player will not win the NBA championship this season, they should be somehow disqualified for the MVP. Here's a fact, Jack. You go over the past 30 NBA seasons, 30 NBA seasons. Guess how many MVPs also won an NBA championship? Eight. And it's only six specific players because Michael Jordan did it twice and LeBron James did it twice. Let's go down the list. Hakeem Olajuwon in 1994, Michael Jordan in 1996 and 1998, Shaq in 2000, Tim Duncan in 2003, LeBron James in 2012 and 2013, and Steph Curry in 2015. End of the list. That's six players, and by the way, six of the greatest players ever that have won an MVP and won an NBA championship in the same season. That seems odd. Or maybe it's because it's more likely that the best team is going to win an NBA championship. Let's look back at the same 30-year period. A number one seed has won the NBA championship 14 times in 30 years. And of those 14 champions, 11 of them either had the best record or were tied for the best record in the regular season. So there's been eight times that a player has won an MVP and also won an NBA championship. And there's been 14 times that a number one seed has won a championship. There's actually only been six times that an MVP on a number one seed has won a championship. That's six times in 30 years. Those players, again, Michael Jordan, twice. Steph Curry, once. LeBron, once. Tim Duncan, once. Shaq, once. So look, historically speaking, the MVP is not a great predictor of who is going to win an NBA championship. More often, it's the number one seed. And often, the reason that a player on those teams don't win an MVP is because those teams are fucking loaded. 
not only do they have a Batman, a Robin, they probably have a bunch of Alfreds, maybe a Catwoman, maybe a Lucius Fox. That's what the NBA is. That's what basketball is. You need more than one guy to win an NBA championship. And that doesn't take away from anything that the best players on the best teams are able to accomplish during the regular season. They should always be in the conversation for MVP, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are the most valuable player in the NBA regular season. By the way, did you know that Russell Westbrook is top six all time in assist percentage? I I want to sum it up with this. Part of the reason why only eight MVPs have won a championship in the last 30 years is because winning a championship is hard. And a lot of the playoffs comes down to matchups. Look at the 07 Dallas Mavericks. That Golden State team was a tough matchup for them. Long, versatile defenders. They could switch all the off-ball screens and on-ball screens with Dirk. They loaded up to him. They made life miserable on him. The question is, did Dirk have enough help? Not whether or not he should have been the MVP in the regular season. And maybe this year is the ninth year in 31 years that the MVP also wins the championship. But if it isn't, it doesn't mean that that MVP wasn't deserving of the award. As voters, as analysts, we have more information at our fingertips than ever before to make an educated opinion about who we think the MVP of the regular season should be. Cheers, mate. All right, let's welcome in Josh Applebaum from Beeson to talk playoff odds. All right, let's welcome in our resident sports betting expert, Josh Applebaum from VEASAN. Josh, how are we feeling today? We're feeling great, JJ. You and I have done a few pods, you know, regular season, you know, end of the regular season. Now we get to talk playoffs. So best time of year for fans of basketball, for betters. I'm excited to break it all down with you today. Yeah, we are recording this the day after game two of the Sixers and Nets series and game two of the Kings and Warriors series. So any data we have, is of uh, Tuesday, April 18th. Uh, I actually want to start with some of the injuries that happened over the weekend. Unfortunately, Tyler Hero looks like he will be out for an extended period of time uh, with two broken fingers. Giannis had a a tough fall, as did Ja. It sounds like both of the, uh, for them, the images came back clean and there's not a, a structural injury, but obviously we don't know how effective Giannis will be in terms of mobility and quickness, given the area where he fell. And we don't know how effective Ja will be uh, because of the hand injury to his shooting hand and uh, something that was already bothered him. So my question to you is, uh, how have sort of the odds shifted around the Bucks and Grizzlies after these two injuries? Yeah, so we've seen a huge shift across the market, JJ. And what's kind of ironic in a way gift and a curse is that when you're betting the regular season we've talked about this quite a bit on the pod there can be late scratches that kind of surprise you I guess the one benefit as a better from looking at these injuries is that we kind of know them going into the games instead of being surprised by them but still we've seen the odds makers have to really adjust their numbers so the biggest one obviously is Giannis now going into the playoffs you actually saw the uh, Bucks as the favorite to win the NBA title JJ going into it they caught the Boston Celtics remember the Celtics were pretty much the favorite all year. They uh, lost that one seed, though, uh, to the Bucs, and the Bucs ripped off all those wins to end the year. Giannis had a run there at MVP, uh, you know, having a great second half of the year. But going into the postseason, you actually had the Bucs at plus 275 to win the NBA title. Now with this injury to Giannis, they're still up there. They're the second best odds now, but they're now plus 310. So really what we've seen as a detriment to the Bucs has been a big benefit to the Boston Celtics. The Celtics went from plus 350 now down to plus 270. And obviously you got to look at it from a kind of mapping out the playoff series. Like now we're seeing uh, this really tough series that probably is going to uh, go deep here with the Miami heat, depending and I'll give you the price here in a second, JJ versus the Celtics who looked like they handled the Hawks pretty well in game one. And now if that's an easier path for them and having learned from last year that, Hey, get rid of these teams early. Don't extend these games to five, six, seven games. If you can get out of these with, you know, an early series sweep and get extra rest, uh, that could be a big benefit to Boston. So it's really benefited Boston, this Giannis injury, especially in the East. But JJ, here's what I wanted to ask you in terms of a kind of a value bet, because as betters, you know, we're looking at betting each game in particular, but also having some futures bets. That means playing playoff series prices, just who's going to win the series. And after every game, you see a big adjustment depending on who wins. So just from your take in this in particular series with the Bucks, JJ, we had the Bucks 
as a minus 1200 favorite to beat the heat going into the series. Now that's a huge number. You'd have to lay $1,200 just to win a hundred. That tells you what almost a shoe in it was for the bucks to win the series. Well, now that they're down one Oh, and Giannis is a little bit banged up. The series has been adjusted now to bucks only minus 295 with the heat plus 235. So you mentioned it. It's not just Giannis. It's also Tyler hero. Who's going to miss some time here with the, the broken hand. Uh, so my question to you, JJ, is is that a bettable number now? Are you number one? Are you worried about the Bucks getting past the Heat? And if you're not at minus two ninety five, when you were minus twelve hundred, if you still have Middleton who's healthy, who dropped thirty three in Game One, you still have Holiday, you have the good coaching, you have the pedigree. I'm of the opinion that maybe it's a good time to buy low on the Bucks to get past the Heat. If if Hero was still healthy, JJ, it'd be a little bit tougher here. But what's your take? Are the Bucks in trouble? Back injuries, you never know how those are going to go. But I'm thinking right now you could buy low on down uh, 1-0 in the series at minus 295. That's really not a bad number for Milwaukee to come back and beat the Heat. I agree with you. And let me start with this because when Miami secured the eight seed, my thought process was that was going to be a tough series regardless. Um, We all know that they've faced each other in the playoffs before. The Heat have gotten past them. They've lost to them. Uh, the Heat tend to muck things up. They 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 can switch to zones. They play hard. So much of their success is dependent upon whether or not they're making threes. They actually shot the ball better towards the end of the regular season than they did for the first 70 games, basically. But over the last 12 to 15 games, they shot the ball better. So there's some momentum and rhythm there for their shooters. Max Struess, of course, had a big uh, play-in game to secure the eight spot. So I always thought this was going to be a tough series. Um, with Giannis banged up, I still think the Bucks win. And losing Hero makes me think it even more. Because <laughs> when we talk about the Miami Heat, the question mark for me is, can they score? You know, can they score enough to beat the Bucks? even without Giannis, can Jimmy replicate his game one performance? Hey, we're all aware of the fact that Jimmy Butler can have performances of like that in the playoffs. He does it on the regular. Can he do it over seven games, six games, whatever, to get past the Bucs? That remains to be seen. I think he can. I still think the Bucs end up winning this series, which is why I think if you're willing to to not play sort of a a, a high-risk bet, I still think those odds are good to play a bet on the Bucks. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you, JJ. And again, you got to ask yourself, you know, what was the pre-flop bet? As we mentioned, minus 1200. Again, that's really not bettable. It's just so expensive. So now that you're and the other thing someone taught me a long time ago is, you know, injuries, sometimes they can be overvalued. Like obviously Giannis is an incredibly important player, like a quarterback to an NFL line or a goalie in hockey to, a, you know, an NHL line. So he's going to move the number quite a bit here. But, you know, sometimes the public can just say, hey, no Giannis, they have no shot. You're almost buying low a little bit with some of these injuries. Uh, so to me, again, minus 295, you still have home court, no hero on the other side. To me, that's definitely a bettable number. But JJ, I want to throw this one at you too. Uh, looking at the Grizzlies, you mentioned the John ja Morant injury. Now this one is super interesting just from a series perspective and then how you project this series to go. So with the Grizzlies down one nothing to the Lakers and John ja Morant now getting hurt, although as you mentioned, it doesn't sound like a break. It's kind of unclear, but it doesn't sound that ominous. Maybe he'll be able to come back here, so stay glued to Twitter. Get all the updates as soon as you can find them. But the Grizz going into it, we talked about them all year, JJ, as maybe a, a Cinderella-type team. They were plus 1,800 to win the title, but now down one nothing, and now with this uh, John ja Morant you know, questionable status, they're plus 4,000. So we've really seen a hit here to the Grizzlies, uh, and we also have seen a big benefit to the Lakers here. Now, the Lakers... Uh, who are up one nothing? They opened the series as actually a, a dog. They were plus one fifteen. Now we're seeing the Lakers at minus three hundred to win this series. So my question to you, JJ, again, to me as a better, it's hard to lay these minus numbers after you're up one zero. Like if really the 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 play the, to make money in the uh, kind of the series market is when you buy on a team that's down when you're getting a plus money number. So the Grizz are plus two forty, JJ, and uh, really to me, it's a big difference here between an older team with experience, but also you're worried. You know, at any point, could LeBron get hurt? Could Anthony Davis get hurt versus a uh, Golden versus a uh, Grizzlies team who's got the youth, doesn't really have the experience, but now one of your star players is hurt. But I'm going to give you some credit here, JJ. Do they lean on their defense? Because we found out last night, Jaron Jackson Jr., who you highlighted. Remember we did a pod, it was Brooke Lopez and Jaron Jackson who would win Defensive Player of the Year. Well, Jackson wins that award. And again, they gave up 128 in the first game to the Lakers. 
They were second in defensive efficiency all year. Is it this fallen hero theory where, hey, if Jaw's out, let's win it for Jaw, or is it deflating? Like, we don't have Jaw, we can't get it done. But what I'm thinking is, if you can buy low and maybe you get a bad break the other way with an injury on the Lakers, I'm kind of intrigued by buying low on the Grizzlies at plus 240. But what do you think? Is this now the Lakers series to win? It's sad that we ha- we have to talk about injuries this way <laughs> because there's, it's <laughs> almost like, hey, it's a war of attrition to some degree. Which team is going to be the healthiest for the next two months? That team probably has the best chance to win an NBA championship. Uh, don't like the bet for the Grizzlies at plus 4,000. I know that those odds have shifted a ton. Um, I... You know, I, I think if they had a healthy Steven Adams and a healthy Brandon Clark, let's say they were at plus 1,800, I think that's good action there if you're looking for high upside. Um, because I, I do think when this team is is whole and complete, they can compete with anybody in the NBA. As it relates to this series, and now them shifting to plus 240, I still think they have a chance to win this series. Um, I don't know that we have a, as big of a sample size as we need to really gauge how good this Lakers team is. You can talk me that into them losing the series. You can talk me into them getting to the NBA championship and and playing for uh, a title. So I, it's hard for me to really gauge this series um, or or this this Lakers team. I will say this about the Grizzlies: last year we saw it uh, in December when Ja was out, uh, not as good for most of the season, but then that shifted in March when he was suspended, where Tyus Jones leading this team. They got a lot of wins. They were in games. They got a lot of wins. They still have a chance in the series, even if Jaws playing and a- unable to shoot the basketball as well as he wants. Uh, I-, I still think the Grizzlies have a chance in this series. The one thing I want to mention before we move on to another series, because we talked about it on this episode of Islands in the League, um, you know, there's been so much discussion around MVP uh, and this season in particular. Over the last 30 years, only eight MVPs have also won the championship. Over the last 30 years, uh, 14 one seeds have won the NBA championship. And 11 of those one seeds also had the best record in the NBA that season. So it's more likely that a one seed and a team uh, you know, with the best record, i.e. the Bucs, i.e. the Bucs, have the best chance to win a championship. And that's reflected in the odds. So to me, if like you're willing, you want to make a safe bet. I I I think the safe bet uh, are the top two teams, the Bucks and the Celtics. Those are the safe bets to me when we talk championship odds. I'm right there with you, JJ. And again, it's kind of been this back and forth Celtics Bucks pretty much all year. Even you go into uh, starting into this season, both these teams are around I think plus four hundred, plus five hundred. Also goes to show you, you know, we're talking about the odds that are available to us now. But if you really want to be the best better you can be, you take some of these some preseason action here because. You know, in a way, you could be holding maybe both Bucks plus 500 and Celtics plus 500. But yeah, I'm with you, JJ. Sometimes it's, you know, when you're talking about different series and betting, you know, all the hot takes, all the big clicks are like, hey, I want, you know, maybe the Nuggets at plus 900. We throw out one of these other teams that has a big payout. And I think the betting public, it's weird. They, they, on the one hand, they want to bet favorites because favorites are, quote unquote, the best teams expected to win, expected to get it done. But also they want to have a money making mindset here, almost like a parlay mentality of, hey, you know, Celtics, maybe they'll win it. They probably will. But at plus 270, I'm not getting the biggest payout. I'd rather take a shot on a longer shot team here. So to your point, like Lakers, they're plus 1200. And again, they're I, I totally agree with you, JJ. They could lose this series. They could win it all. Those are the teams that you're taking more risk over. Uh, but I do think, you know, what it, the numbers that you gave us in particular, you do see the cream rise to the top. So uh, I'm currently, JJ, holding a, a Celtics plus uh, plus 400 ticket. So I'm in Boston. That's what I'm rooting for. But uh, again, should be exciting time. And, and again, chalk does typically win the title. Well, at least you can admit, admit your homerism, you know, that's a, that's a, very, it's a yeah. strong trait. It's a strong trait. <laughs> um, I want to talk Warriors Kings. And I, I do want to talk about one other uh, Western Conference matchup and, and just title odds on them. But Warriors Kings, where do we stand with that series? How did that series start? We are recording this again after game two. So we know for a fact Kings up 2-0 going back to Golden State this weekend. Yeah, JJ, this is one of the most fascinating series. I think one of the most exciting and probably the biggest money making opportunity here. So going into the series, you had the Warriors a minus 275 favorite to win the series. The Kings were plus 210. Now, you actually did see some respect to money on the Warriors to move that number further. I think they were like maybe minus 250 ish and you had some steam before the series even started for the Warriors to get it done. But now with the Kings up 2-0, 
huge, uh, huge shift here in the odds. JJ, we now have the Kings a minus 160 favorite to win this series. Uh, Golden State plus 135. And, you know, kind of it's cliche, you hear it all the time, but, you know, an NBA series or an NHL, Stanley Cup playoff series, it doesn't start until a road team wins a playoff game. So obviously the Kings taking care of business here, winning the first two, but now you're going to flip the series and get uh, some home court games here with Golden State. You have the pedigree, you have the experience, uh, you have the coaching, obviously. Curry's been here and been there, done that. They played in big games. So what I'm looking at here is, JJ, is there an opportunity to bet Golden State at plus 135? Is there value there? The Kings obviously have been one of the most surprising teams. Uh, I was holding a Missoula ticket for coach of the year, but it probably looks like Mike Brown is going to win that award. Uh, however, as great of a story as the Kings have been, you know, is there still an opportunity to buy low? I never want to underestimate. It's almost like Brady and the Patriots those days, they, JJ. You don't want us to underestimate the pedigree of a championship team. So at plus 135, when you open a series minus 275, my question to you, and I think there is, is there value to Golden State coming back and winning this series? Or are they really, are the Kings really uh, kind of exposing them? And do you expect the Kings to pull off this upset, even though now they're favored? Yeah, I still believe the Warriors can win this series. Um, I will say a, a few things just basketball related, and that is they've had a game plan for the Kings defensively. They've done a great job on the dribble handoff action. By and large, they've kept De'Aaron Fox out of the paint and turned him into a jump shooter. And you have these crazy splits with his jump shooting for, through the first two games. He's four for 20 on jump shots through three quarters, and he's seven for 11 in the fourth quarter. Obviously, we know he's been a fantastic clutch time performer all season long. He's been great in the clutch, and so they win two clutch games at home. I'm not overreacting to that. The Warriors have issues with turnovers. The Warriors have issues with fouls. We all know that. I think when they get home, their three-point shooting will normalize a little bit, just 32% through two games. The other thing that I don't think enough people are talking about is the impact that Draymond Green's ejection will have on the officiating. My observation is, through two games, this was as physical of a series as I've seen this playoff season and, and in recent memory. The amount of stuff that they're allowing, both on and off the ball, it's not really regular season rules. And so because of the incident with Sabonis, which, by the way, was like the fourth time they had been tangled up in this series, because of the incident with Sabonis and Green, will the officiating be a little tighter? Will they start calling some of those holds for uh, when, when you know, Davion Mitchell and Darian Fox are grabbing Steph Curry off the ball? And if that happens, even for a game or two, hey, the Warriors are right back in it. And this is... Even at 2-0, I, I, I just can't disrespect the Warriors, right? They have a championship pedigree. It is hard to beat a champion in the playoffs. Of course, I'm favoring the Kings, but to me, it still feels a little bit like a pick series. I'm with you, and if you're getting plus money on a team that's been there, done that, won all these titles, like, they played in, in huge games here, and I think, JJ, and, you know, maybe you can speak to this too, like, when you're on a, a powerhouse team and you're used to winning all the time, Sometimes you got to create some more, you know, adversity for yourself, create some more mojo, get yourself going a little bit. So maybe, uh, and Draymond obviously playing that role, you know, as a Celtics fan, going back to uh, the the NBA title last year, you know, the, the Celtics were up in that series 2-1, you know, their the Celtics crowd was screaming at, J at Draymond. He got his team going. He kind of got in the Celtics head. So I, I think with Draymond, it's kind of interesting. Like, you know, his stats don't really impress you, but his importance to the team is huge here in terms of a, you know, kind of the, the pulse of your team, uh, kind of that mean streak, that edge. Every championship team needs that. So maybe Draymond knew what he was doing, kind of getting, to, getting into a scuffle there, getting his team going. It's almost like, again, in the NHL, when you uh, your, your team's kind of like, you know, struggling through the first five minutes, you know, maybe your fourth line guy picks a fight just to get you going there. So that could be meaningful. And then also, JJ, I'm so glad that you brought up the referees because this is something that I think a lot of betters just totally disregard. Uh, but I think that's a bit of a mistake. You don't want to bet a game, you know, a total over or under or one side or the other just based on a referee and the crew. But you want to be aware of it. Like, for example, Scott Foster, I'm, I'm sure you have some maybe some stories about Scott Foster, JJ, but he's one of the most lopsided referees toward home, uh, toward road teams because he always wants to uh, kind of show the crowd that he's uh, you know unbiased to a fault. And then also toward a lot of overs because he calls a lot of whistles. So. Uh, the other thing is like, you know, home court, it is important. Typically the odds makers will give you around three points for home court, but it's not always the crowd 
you know, that provides you that big advantage. Obviously, that is a, a component to it. But it's also these referees. When you get to these refs who sometimes will be just uh, wary of, you know, going against the crowd, like a guy like Foster will do it. But a lot of the younger referees, they'll make calls, you know, in favor of the home crowd because they don't want to get screamed at and have stuff thrown at them. So to me, that's a, a kind of a benefit and something you should always keep an eye out for. I think this they post the uh, the crew. I think 9 a.m. typically is when you'll find out who they are. But that's always something I dig into. Like, you know, if if the Warriors are in a spot where you have three home refs that all favor home teams, that's a benefit, especially when you're trying to get back in the series. And we should mention uh, this will already have been out by the time this game happens. But tonight, Scott Foster is calling game two of the Phoenix Suns and Clippers <laughs> series. Uh, and of course, him and Chris Paul have a beautiful history uh, of interaction together. A <laughs> I actually want to discuss the Clippers because I'm looking at the odds right now and they're at plus 2,500 to win the NBA championship. Uh, We don't know when or if Paul George will be available. The latest reports are that he will most likely miss all of the Sun series, even if it goes seven games. But I can't help but be impressed with the Clippers Kawhi, obviously, his brilliance from the mid-range and scoring in isolation, but also their bench. And a number of those guys, Russell Westbrook picked up through buyout, but a number of those guys at the trade deadline. And so you had a real impact in game one from Mason Plumley, Bones Highland, Terrence Mann, and uh, Norman Powell were already there pre-trade deadline. But this Clippers team, we have talked about their depth all season and we saw that come to fruition in that game one where they had a number of players make a real impact on that game besides just Kawhi scoring I I don't know at 20 plus 2500 I I think they're they're that's a little bit of a disservice to this Clippers team some of that has to be I want to get your opinion on this some of it that has to be the matchup right because they're going against the Suns who have the best odds in the Western Conference. Yes, that's a great point. To me, 2,500 is kind of intriguing. I think that could be considered a value play, JJ. Obviously, you know, we let off today's podcast talking about injuries and how they can affect the numbers. So, you know, Paul George, to me, that's the biggest question mark. If you're telling me that he's going to be back at some point in the series and he'll be able to play throughout much of the playoffs once he recovers, then 2,500 is a pretty good number there. If you're telling me he's out, and again, no one really knows, we're going to have to scour Twitter and get get some insights into the severity of the injury and, and if or not if or when he'll come back but then I'm a little bit less into the Clippers based on the plus 2500 but I will say just from a betting standpoint JJ you're kind of playing with house money here with the Clippers like they went into the series against the Suns as a plus 375 dog uh, they're now down to plus 160 so if you think after stealing game one and to your point uh, the trades that they've made to really uh, bring in some more big men and kind of lengthen their roster a little bit you know, if they can give the, the Suns a run for their money at plus 160, you're still getting plus money despite the fact that you're up 1-0 in the series. Typically, when you take a lead, you're going to flip to a favorite price there. So I got to know the status there of Paul George, but I'm with you. I've been impressed uh, by how they played. And then also with the Suns, JJ, just from your perspective, you know, they have the big names. Obviously, the trade for Durant is the biggest one, but you have Chris Paul with all the experience. You have Devin Booker. You have Aiton. Uh, but also, you're going to have a, a chip on your shoulder with the Clippers saying, you know, hey, no one believes in us. You can kind of play that card of, you know, Durant's the, a great player. The public will gravitate toward the Suns. Could that be a motivating factor for the Clippers, JJ? Like uh, the chip on your shoulder, no one believes in us card. To me, if you can create any kind of adversity or add a motivation, it's always a, 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 you know, a benefit. And then also Durant, remember he was hurt for quite a bit. He slipped on the floor. He missed a lot of games. He doesn't have a lot of minutes uh, with kind of the, this core here. So maybe he doesn't need, uh, you know, all this experience here but I'd be much more confident in the Suns if he had played more and got to know his teammates a little bit better. Yeah, it's fair, and and I think those are all valid points. Uh, Ty Lue actually, in the post-first quarter interview, referenced how everyone was picking against the Clippers and they had nothing to lose. So clearly that's a talking point within that team. Josh, we didn't get to everything we wanted to get to. I can't thank you enough for the time. It's really been fascinating. Appreciate it as always. Always a pleasure, JJ. Thanks for having me. This has been another episode of Islands in the League presented by DraftKings. Thank you for watching. We'll be back very soon with episode five.